I'm Hamish Johnston, editor of PhysicsWorld.com, and I'm here in Dallas, Texas for the March meeting of the American Physical Society. 25 years ago, the first high temperature superconductor was discovered, and since then, an incredible amount of research has gone into finding more materials and also into trying to understand the physics of this remarkable state of matter. With me is Paul Grant, who is at IBM in 1986 and has dedicated much of his career to looking at applications for superconductors. Paul, what yeah. was the buzz in uh, industry when the first high TC material was found, and how has that changed over the last 25 years? Well, first of all, Hamish, the buzz was uh, uh, people didn't believe it. Uh, they, were, they were skeptical, but it was qu quite quickly proven that uh, the phenomenon that uh, George Bednortz had measured in January of 1986 was readily reproducible all over the world, and it was um, perhaps just a year before Paul Chu found a phase that went superconducting at 91 degrees Kelvin above the uh, boiling point of liquid nitrogen. And that had been a holy grail for, for years. So the scientific buzz was electric, to use a pun, but the uh, applications were thought of at the same time as well. But I want to emphasize in the beginning it was a science that was exciting. Now, uh, in terms of applications, superconductivity has had a, um, how shall I say, a colorful past. And it was hoped, especially in power applications, that these new materials would enable uh, power equipment like transformers and transition, transmission lines and energy storage devices. So this, this was what uh, the street buzz was. I have to tell you, though, in IBM, we were much calmer about our discovery than many of our academic colleagues who really uh, went nonlinear with some of their predictions because, in my opinion, they never had any industrial experience. And what about now, Paul? Are people as excited about high TC materials 25 years later? Uh, in regard that we don't know what causes it, yes. In terms of applications, uh, there have been many successful demonstrations and prototypes made. And the way I put it, Hamish, is, is, is the technology is on the shelf. And it works, and it works well. And uh, speaking as an American, our national labs have done a marvelous job, as has the industry. But now it's up to the marketplace to take this uh, wonderful phenomenon and use it. Okay. So that's where it sits. Okay. I mean, a, a room temperature um, superconductor, that's, that's a holy grail, really, for, right. for physicists. That's but, right. you know, let, let, let's say one was discovered. Mm -hmm. What would a company do with such a material, and how could they make money out of a room okay. temperature superconductor? Uh, that, that's, a, that's a great question, because uh, if we had a room temperature superconductor, at least according to the, the theories that we have now, it would not likely be a perfect conductor. There's a, there's a difference between a superconductor and a perfect conductor, and it lies deep within the physics and, and the jargon of our trade. But uh, utilities tell me that they would love to have uh, a conducting material that's 200 times more conductive than copper at room temperature. Okay? That's their definition of a room temperature superconductor. But I want to emphasize that it doesn't have to be a perfect conductor. Now, how would we use it? Well, you wouldn't swap out all the existing uh, infrastructure. But my crystal ball tells me it could enable a hydrogen economy because you could transport easily now mass amounts of electricity to the gas station, okay, or I guess what you guys call the forecourt, and, and make hydrogen uh, locally now uh, it has to be transported in vast trucks. It's difficult to handle. So that's my vision of a room temperature superconductor. It might enable the hydrogen economy. You're an advocate of using superconducting cables in uh, an electrical grid. Um, is the technology available at the moment for such a supergrid? And when do you think it could be implemented? Yeah, the technology is available in principle. It's on the shelf. Now, it's up to, uh, you know, uh, it's a matter of, of policy, societal uh, uh, issues. It's not technology. I mean, we have it. Is there a good reason to build such a grid? 
And right now, the, at least in the United States, the economic advantages aren't there yet. What I see is, uh, and again, speaking of North America, as we begin to continue to exploit our natural gas reserves, many of which exist up in northern Canada on the Arctic Ocean, instead of transporting that gas down south, you know, to more middle lat latitudes, uh, where 40 to 50 percent is going to be made into electricity, why not generate that electricity at the wellhead where the gas fields are and wheel that electricity down on a superconducting cable right alongside the gas pipelines? And then when the gas runs out in 20 to 30 years, it's a perfectly great place to locate nuclear power plant clusters. Um, superconductors have proven very useful in physics experiments, mm -hmm. everything from the, the large Hadron Collider to mm -hmm. quantum computing mm -hmm. systems use them. Um, are, are there any exciting physics applications on the horizon that you can see? Well, physics applications, uh, I'm not sure. Medical applications, yes, because uh, we have magnetic sensors called squids that in principle could be able to measure the magnetic field uh, emanated from the human body by chemical and electrical reactions within it. And so you would have a complete diagnostic tool of everything that's going on inside you in real time. Tremendous amounts of money and time have been spent looking mm -hmm. into the physics behind high TC superconductors. Mm -hmm. And I think it's fair to say that we still don't really have a good idea of the sort of underlying mechanisms. Do, do you think that that's been time and money well spent? Well, first of all, we, I would maintain we don't have a good idea of the mechanism of uh, itinerant uh, ferromagnets like iron and nickel, but that doesn't stop us from building transformers and, and motors and making billions of dollars. So the important thing is, is that for application, you really don't have to, it helps to understand the physics but uh, it doesn't necessarily impede the uh, application. Uh, the U.S. Department of Energy, over 20 years, has spent roughly a billion dollars, a billion in U.S. units. Now, is that a lot of money? And the technology's on the shelf and works? I don't think so. Well, thanks for joining us today, yeah, Paul. Sure. You're welcome.